I want to thank everyone again for coming today. Uh, for those of you that stayed through the first two panels, uh, we have a real treat in store for the final panel. For those who have just joined us for dinner tonight, uh, welcome. This is a, uh, an exciting day for all of us and a terrific way to end that day. Uh, for the few of you that have just joined us, uh, the Miller Center and the, and the Reagan Library have been working together for many years, uh, in particular on the Reagan Oral History Project, and we have one alumnus of that project with us uh, who I'll introduce in a second. Uh, and through that partnership and a number of other engagements over the years, it was a big priority for us in our first year project to do an event here. And I just want to thank again uh, Tony Panay and all of the folks from the Reagan Library who have, have made this a very special day for all of us. So let's give them a big round of applause. And the Reagan Institute that is under Tony's supervision in Washington is a very exciting venture, which is another partnership that we are delighted to share. Um, as those of us who, are, those of you who were with us earlier today know, the first year project has been combing presidential history and taking advantage in particular of something that we at the Miller Center are very proud of, which is our alumni association. Uh, it turns out we have two types of alumni. We don't have students at the Miller Center. We just, we just do research. But a big part of our research are these oral histories. And the biggest and in some ways uh, the most unique alumni we have are the people who have participated in our oral histories. We have a number of those folks up on the stage with us today. Um, and I'll introduce them to you. We have a second kind of alumni who are scholars at the Miller Center, including uh, young undergraduate and graduate student researchers who work on our project. So the one person on our panel who has not participated in oral history with us happens to be an alumni of that, and we are delighted to hear that. So going through the panel, to my left is, uh, immediate left is Ken Kajigian, who was uh, a speech writer in, uh, in President Reagan's first term and also in the Nixon administration. Um, to his left is, uh, uh, figuratively or literally, I'm not sure, <laughs> his left, Mary Kate Carey, who was a speechwriter for Bush 41. Uh, David Kuznet, who was a speechwriter in the Clinton administration. John McConnell, who was a speechwriter in Bush 43. And Kyle O'Connor, who was a speechwriter in the Obama administration. We have not done an Obama oral history, but he is a graduate of the University of Virginia and worked in our recordings or oral history program? Uh, recordings. Recordings yeah. program, where we transcribe the secret Oval Office recordings of the Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon administration. So uh, this is a terrific group. I know that there is actually one White House Alumni Association, and it's the Alumni of Speechwriters. What's the name of the? Uh, Judson Welliver. Say it again. Judson Welliver. The Judson Welliver Society. Uh, Society. But uh, so I'm guessing that there have probably been speechwriters from five consecutive administrations assembled before. But if there haven't, this is the first time, and we're delighted about that. Uh, <laughs> I was going to start with a couple questions, and then we'll throw it right over to the audience. And the first question to the panel, and I'm going to defer to Ken as the dean of this group. Uh, Ken, tell us a little bit. We had a panel today about uh, the transition from campaigning to governing. From the perspective of a speechwriter and the perspective of the president that you worked for, describe that transition. What is it like to go from writing political speeches to, to writing the State of the Union, I mean the, um, the inaugural address, which is the first speech as, as president? When does that change start happening? When did it happen in your mind? When did it happen in President Reagan's mind? Well, basically, uh, is this, oh, okay, I'm on. Um, or, we were beating Jimmy Carter's brains out until the election day. Uh, uh, it wasn't until uh, that night when uh, the election returns came in and, and uh, <clears throat> Governor Reagan became President-elect Reagan uh, after President Carter called him up and congratulated him. And uh, I called up, uh, or I uh, called for, up for President Reagan, Governor Reagan, and and asked him what kind of remarks he would want to make. And, and uh, he said he was putting, just putting pen to paper, and I, actually he wasn't. Uh, he was waiting for me to put, <laughs> put, put, put pen to paper. And uh, so uh, the transition really began that night when the remarks turned from strong partisanship to uh, starting uh, unifying the country and, and creating an, um, 
an, an air of, of more responsibility in terms of how he would present himself uh, in, in the run-up to his administration and, of course, to his inaugural address. So that begins almost immediately. Um, uh, Governor Reagan had a great reverence for the presidency, uh, even during the campaign, uh, even though the campaign, by, by, by the way, by today's standards, that campaign was pretty tame. <laughs> And uh, uh, when I look back at some of the, <coughs> the speeches we gave uh, uh, attacking uh, President Carter, it really wasn't that rough as uh, by today's standards. But uh, he had a great reverence for the presidency. And, and even if you look at his final speeches, and then uh, if you have a chance on YouTube or, or here, maybe the Reagan Library has it, uh, President Reagan's 30-minute uh, election eve broadcast, uh, you can see he's already beginning that transition to um, uh, creating a warm, warm, more inspiring look of America than and less of a, a campaign attack. So I, I think uh, you could say that he was looking at it at that election eve address. Mm -hmm. Mary Kay, you talked about it a little bit in your panel today in similar lines. But when did that transition start happening in your brain? Did you learn to start writing differently? and? And did you also hear it in the president and, and see him respond as well? Yeah, as I said earlier today, and I apologize if some of you had to hear this twice, but uh, so I was senior writer for communications on the Bush quail campaign. And I wrote uh, what would be a pretty partisan document every day that went out to all 50 state chairs on what was going on in the campaign. And, uh, and to my great surprise, we won the election. And they said, we'd like you to come to the White House. And I was shocked because I thought, well, they're not going to have a document like that at the White House. And sure enough, the president thought that was uh, uh, highly partisan to have what was called the line of the day. And, and I think they have it now. But back then, that was considered campaigning. And now we're going to switch to governing. And so um, my first job at the White House was, was not as a speechwriter, uh, since I wasn't a speechwriter on the campaign. But it was uh, to ghostwrite articles by the president for magazines. And it was. Uh, like I was saying earlier, you know, why I love country music for Country Music Magazine by George Bush or, you know, uh, Parade Magazine, places like that. And then eventually I got switched into speech writing. And at that time, I was the only writer who had come from the campaign. Everybody else uh, were from outside uh, cabinet officials or uh, governor's offices, places like that. And, and once I became a speech writer, because I had been on the campaign, I was the one who was assigned uh, for the president to write uh, campaign uh, speeches uh, when he would campaign for state officials or governors or whatever, because I was considered so partisan. Oh. So uh, it was very much the difference between, uh, you know, campaigning and governing was very clear to me because that was my job. And, uh, and the president found that, I think, somewhat uh, distasteful in a lot of ways. He'd much rather uh, do a foreign policy speech or uh, something like that. You didn't hold it personally against you, though. No, we had a great time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> David? Well, I, I was chief speechwriter in candidate Bill Clinton's campaign in 92 and then in the White House for the first two years. So I and my, my cohort went through the transition from campaigning to preparing to be the administration to being the administration. And as I believe Mary Kate said this afternoon, the three major speeches that sort of delineate that evolution are the victory speech on election night, where you thank the American people, extend an olive branch to your opponent, and sort of sum up the campaign. Then there's the inaugural address, which is, in a sense, the ritual reunification of the American people after the after a campaign and the transformation of a candidate who is the leader of one party into a president who is the leader of the nation. And then and I think it, it dates back to the to the Reagan years, but it's become standard practice now that the newly elected president gives a joint session address early in the year, which strictly speaking, is not a State of the Union, but is where the new president sets forth an, econ an economic program. And those are, are sort of the three, I think, the three signature speeches. Is the famous line by the late former governor of New York, 
Mario Cuomo that you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. I think, at least at the presidential level, you campaign in partisan stump speeches. You try to give the inaugural in poetry, and then you give the joint session speech in, in prose, sometimes in very detailed and lengthy prose. And the challenge really after that initial period is to maintain the, the high-minded tone, at least before even numbered, in the fall of even numbered years, to maintain the high-minded presidential tone of the inaugural and the substantive tone of that first address to the joint session of Congress, but still to make a, a point that persuades the people and through the people persuades their elected representatives to support your, to support your program. And that, that's quite a challenge, particularly if you're a candidate who's run as Bill Clinton did in 92 by challenging really 12 years of governance before him and comes from outside of Washington and has an insurgent mentality, which brings with it, I think, in balance, greater strengths than weaknesses, especially in this era of public alienation that we see very much this year. But I think you could see the origins of it in, in 1992. But that does create challenges for, for governance because you can't, you can't govern as you campaign. You can't have a presidential speech that's mostly an attack that mostly takes a pessimistic view of the condition of the country, but you can't have stump speeches that, that do that. And for, the, for those of you who are scholars, I think a very, a, and we're all, we're all amateur scholars or professional scholars, you can find this online, but I think an illustration of the challenge we had working for President Clinton was we, we as, as Clinton was wont to do, we gave that initial speech about the economic program in two installments. The second installment, which is better known, was the, and deservedly so, was the joint session speech, I still remember the date, on February 17th, 1993, where he set forth his economic plan. But two days before, there was Is an Oval the Office. That, they, that they loaded the wrong speech into the No, that, that, that was in the fall. Oh, okay. That came in the fall. And there was never a dull moment with us. <laughs> but two days before, he gave an Oval Office speech. And the Oval Office speech was, in a sense, a continuation of the campaign. It was at least perceived by many as a, as a partisan and ideological speech. And the joint session speech was much more elevated and presidential. So if you go, you know, in the Clinton Library and the speech file, online Clinton Library and the speech file, and look for Oval Office, February 15th, 1993, and then joint session, February 17th, 1993, you can really see the evolution of a newly elected president from still talking like a candidate to talking like a president. John, do you, in, first of all, is that transition pretty consistent with your own experience? And <clears throat> if so, when, when did you start to feel that turn happening? And when did you start going from poetry to prose? Well, um, it's pretty dramatic. I was on the Bush-Cheney campaign in 2000, and it was really the first campaign of the modern era where it was just hand-to-hand -hand combat between the two nominees even before they were nominated. Uh, as soon as uh, Gore took care of Bradley and Bush took care of McCain, there was no lull, there was no summer slowdown. It was just, it, everybody knew it was going to be a close election, or at least suspected it would be. And so it was a real serious, close-in combat situation for seven months. And of course, we were certain, of course, it was going to end on November 8th, and it didn't. Um, and uh, giving us the closest election in history and, and, and then a 30, 35 or 36 day recount process. But it's a dramatic change. You go from uh, uh, laying out the clear dividing lines between your candidate and his adversary, uh, talking about why that dividing line happens to be so important, uh, what the stakes are in this election, and, um, and how consequential, the, the, therefore, the, the choice of one of the other candidates is going to be. And this is everything you do uh, is, is highlighting the, the sharpness of the distinction between the two candidates. And then it's over. In our case, it was not really over, but the campaigning <laughs> 
the campaigning really stopped at that point. And, and even though there were, there were a series of dueling nationally televised addresses that usually followed court decisions, um, that Bush, then Bush and Gore would both have to go on TV. Really, you started in the transition period. Um, it's no longer, as David said, it's no longer about divisions. It's no longer about the contrast. It's about now let's get behind this, this program. Even if you didn't support uh, me in this campaign, now let's uh, uh, join, join uh, in this common cause for the good of the country. Uh, from a speech writing perspective, going from campaigning to governing, as, as fun as campaigns are, and uh, if you like politics, there's nothing better than a presidential campaign. Um, but, but from a speech writing per perspective, it's really great when your boss wins because you go from writing speeches that say, I will propose, I will instruct, I will appoint, to being president who says, I propose. I have instructed, I have appointed. And when you're a speechwriter, you just savor that because you now have the voice of the, the President of the United States, which is a lot more fun than the voice of a candidate for president. <laughs> Kyle? Yeah, we were in a little bit of a different situation just because when President Obama won, um, the economy was losing hundreds of thousands of jobs a month and you know, three of the big five auto, the big three auto companies were on the verge of going bankrupt and things were pretty bad. And so we saw the transition from campaign to governing almost immediately. I wasn't in the hotel room with him when he got the results of the election, but I've heard that he just got very serious and you could see that even in the um, Victory Night speech. Uh, it, it became very real that we were talking about how we wanted to fix these problems, and now it's actually up to us to fix them. Um, and so I, I was a speechwriter for him, but I started out as the research assistant in 2009. And so when we were getting ready for that inaugural address, um, I pulled a bunch of previous uh, inaugurals, which is it's tough to do because not many of them are remembered. Uh, and I say this as somebody who helped write a couple that may not be remembered, but. Um, we, we pulled a lot of uh, FDRs. We pulled uh, Lincoln's second inaugural. We pulled John F. Kennedy's. Um, focus on ones where the, the nation was kind of at a turning point, and uh, we needed people to come together, like John said, and, and push in a certain direction. Um, and then it, it's a pretty abrupt shift into governing. I mean, there's a joke in the Obama speechwriter crew that uh, uh, we, we tried to talk about the Recovery Act, and we used a line that said, the Recovery Act has three parts. And we knew as soon as we wrote that line that we were losing people, because that's really boring. And it's tough to <laughs> stay interested in something when you're describing three parts of a Recovery Act. So it was, it was great to talk about the things we were going to do, but it was also tough to get dragged back down to earth and all of a sudden try and solve some of these big problems you've been talking about for a couple of years. And did the president himself, um, th this goes to the line about going from poetry to prose, did the president himself struggle with that transition of going from sort of the soaring rhetoric of, elec of election night and the inauguration day to dialing into multi-part messages that had been negotiated by teams of policy people and cabinet secretaries? Did, was there a bucking against that? I think so, and we tried to still tell a story. That one of President Obama's instructions to all of us is always tell a story in the speech with a beginning, middle, and end, and so we still tried to do that. The tough part was we were including a lot of really complicated details, um, which necessarily means that it's not gonna be quite as interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was tough for him, and mm -hmm. I think he, there's a difference between doing that inaugural address, which you write for history, and then doing the one the next week where you're trying to get Congress to pass something, and that's, uh, that's a pretty abrupt transition. Yeah, I, I, I want to bring each of you into this because each of these presidents had very distinct voices. But Ken, over dinner, you were talking a little bit about you and President Reagan capturing one another, uh, getting his voice and capturing that voice. You had a very unusual first 98 days of working for President Reagan because you were planning to leave early. President, the assassination attempt happens, and you're sticking around till the big economic speech where within a month of having been shot, he stands up before Congress. At that point, did you know his voice? Were you still in a learning period? What, what was that like? Because that ends up being that economic speech had to get into some policy gristle. No, but, uh, pretty much by then, uh, I, had, I had pretty much meshed with him. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I don't think I would have been around. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, uh, I, as I, uh, uh, said earlier, uh, speechwriters shouldn't confuse themselves with the president. That's the first mistake you would make as a speechwriter, or else you wouldn't be in that job very long. I think that's what a lot of 
speechwriters try to, bad speechwriters try to confuse themselves with being the President of the United States. And uh, I never, uh, I, I quickly learned that that uh, is something not to do. And, and with Reagan, I spent a lot of time listening to him, try to get in his head, uh, get in his ear. And uh, if, you, if you saw uh, Reagan give speeches when he started uh, with the word, uh, well, I don't know if you remember, he'd say, well, uh, I realized uh, that he uh, did that so often that I, that I actually wrote that into the speech text. <laughs> I'd, I'd start sentences with the word well, and I asked him about that. And, and, and he said, actually, uh, that's, uh, he used, that's a stage pause, that he uh, it allows him to have that one brief mini second to think about what he's going to say next. So I actually started working that into the script of his speeches. So that's what, that was what I meant by getting into his head and understanding him. And I could, I could get to the point where I could hear his voice and when did, I gave speeches. And in that first 100-day that first period, including with the assassination attempt thrown in, did he feel, did you feel a pressure to dial down into the policy details that can kill a speech? Uh, was he always looking for the bigger storytelling, the poetic reference, but still having to accommodate that? What was well, that? Well, he like? combined both uh, really brilliantly. Um, for, first of all, he was eager uh, to get the policy out. He'd spent a, a lifetime, um, what he called the mashed potato circuit, and as governor and as a spokesman, uh, trying to get all these uh, policy goals of his out into the public, lower taxes, smaller government, uh, stronger national defense. So when he came into the presidency, he was ambitious and eager to get those policy goals out. He wasn't averse to policy in him, but he always wanted to tell a, using uh, stories to get that across. If you uh, watch his first uh, uh, speech on the economy in the Oval Office, by the way, you stole that from us because we gave, a, <laughs> we gave an Oval Office speech on February 5th and then a joint session speech on February 18th. I mean, you set the template. That's right, to yeah. The modern, to the modern presidency. Yeah. So he gave this Oval Office speech and, uh, on February 5th, and he wanted to describe how uh, the value of a dollar had gone uh, to 36 cents from 1960 to 1980. And so he was telling me how he would have a dollar bill on the, on the desk, and then he was going to take uh, a quarter, a dime, and a penny out of his pocket and show it on the TV. And I, and I said, Mr. President, I said, you know, that's pretty tricky on camera. And he said, don't worry, I can uh, watch, just watch. And so on that first speech, uh, he, to show that value of a dollar shrink, shrink, shrinking to 36 cents, he takes out a dollar bill, and then he takes, reaches into his coat pocket and takes out a quarter, a dime and a penny, and puts it out like this, and only he could do something like that. And then in the, uh, in the joint session speech, he wanted to illustrate how a uh, trillion dollar deficit would be, and he uh, f forced me to go to the Bureau of Mint to find out how high a stack of thousand dollar bills would reach if you stacked them up to reach a trillion dollars, and he used that in his speech. So he combined the policy with the stories uh, to make it real, but he, he really delved into policy. Um, well, President Bush had um, come up through the ranks, as you know, whether it was CIA or uh, uh, the UN or being vice president himself. And so he had tremendous respect for the team behind the scenes who was sending in the, the memos or, like you were saying, the committee that had put together the, uh, the language that had to be just so. And so he was tremendously respectful of that in the speeches. He was much more concerned with things like um, he felt that as, as president, uh, he should not use the word I, he should use we in a democracy. Uh, part of that came from his mother always telling him not to brag, but uh, if, there were, if there were too many I's in a speech, he would circle them and write too many I's at the top, you know? And uh, I, it, we don't want the great I am, he would write that too. Um, but he had a- particular pronoun. Yes, <laughs> he, he liked the plural pronoun. And, um, but he was very comfortable with uh, the policy end of it because he had been there on the other side, I think, for so long. And um, 
he, he had a, a very, he still has a very unique voice. And I, I remember after we left the White House, I interviewed with Dick Cheney. And Dick Cheney said, if, if you write speeches for me, are you going to make me sound like George Bush? And I said, well, how would that be? And he said, uh, I like subjects in my sentences. <laughs> and he said, you know, going to drive to Texas, bought a house, you know, whatever. <laughs> Because <laughs> he wouldn't use I, you know, and so, uh, but but that was sort of his his uh, way of unifying the country was to use the word we. That's very so funny. it's very sweet. Can I interject here Please. just one thing about uh, President Bush? Uh, he is one of the most sweetest te uh, tempered people, the nicest uh, gentleman you can ever imagine. Working with him, uh, I had uh, ex some exposure to him when he was RNC chairman and when he was vice president. But he is really a sweet man and a gentleman. And when he was, uh, the day uh, President Reagan was shot, uh, I, I was, uh, I had the uh, job of writing a statement for him uh, to give to the, to the press uh, when President Reagan was in the hospital. And he, he wanted to make absolutely sure that there was no, not even the slightest indication that he was assuming any kind of power. Right. He's was just, that before or after Al Haig got up and said that he was in charge? <laughs> I think it was after. I think it was because of Al Haig. Yeah. It was afterwards. Yeah. But, but and he, he was very careful not to land. He was coming back in from out of town. and He, did, from Texas. he would not land the, uh, the Secret Service. We're going to land the helicopter on the South Lawn. Uh, and he said, absolutely not. Only the president lands on the South Lawn. Land me over at the VP mansion, and I'll take the car over. And uh, he, he, it was the right thing to do. Uh, but in hindsight, uh, the, the tremendous respect that that earned him amongst the Reagan people, because it was in such stark contrast to Al Haig, that um, it, it paid off in spades. And, mm -hmm. and that's not why he did it. But right. he, uh, he just did not want to look like he was in any way um, stepping forward, no, as, as you saw. I have great affection for and, him. And by the way, Mary Kate, speaking of transitions, I think a lot of people my age are discovering for the first time that letter that President Bush wrote to President Clinton. Yeah. It's, it's being shared all over the place. And so, why, why don't you describe that to people? A couple of people oh, have yeah. referred to it. And well, you, you know this better than I do, but um, it's a letter that President Bush left on the, the desk for President Clinton, and it's this, this incredibly gracious, magnanimous letter about how, you know, uh, we're all behind you and, you know, we wish you the best and, and just incredible. So it's hard to imagine that these days, but yeah. he set the standard. But it started because President Reagan left one for President Bush. Yeah. But it was a different note, obviously, because it started with um, Sandra Boynton's cartoon with a, an elephant on the ground with a bunch of turkeys on top. <laughs> And it said, don't let the turkeys get you down. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then he said, hopefully you'll be able to use this over the years, or you know, keep this in mind, or something for, you know, from the same party. But, but it was uh, you know, never been done, I don't think, where it was left to the, somebody from the next party, and, uh, or a different party. And uh, for some reason, it's gone viral in the last few days. Uh, and and it's, it's a throwback. It's a it's very uh, different world. I'm going to turn to the audience for a question in one second, but I just wanted to bring David back in on President Clinton, who had such a distinctive voice, has still, President Bill Clinton has such a distinctive voice and an ability to tell stories, but also is deeply a policy wonk, right? And as that year rolls along and he is now moving from passing a budget, a series of um, both uh, unforced errors and other um, uh, difficult events that fall on the administration all the way through passing of NAFTA. Did he struggle to capture his voice in that year, or did he always have a voice, but the policy and the process and the act of governing was just too challenging? Wait, he, he, he always, he had, as, as you say, he has a very distinctive voice, or several very distinctive voices. None of them were like his immediate predecessors as president. They're really, I think, any president who was well remembered at the time that he was president. I imagine the private Lyndon Johnson might have sounded like Bill Clinton. I imagine Harry Truman sounded like Bill Clinton. But it wasn't, his natural way of speaking wasn't the elevated, stentorian presidential rhetoric, what he used to call the reversible raincoat sentences that. Theodore Sorensen would write with John F. Kennedy, we shall not negotiate out of fear, but we shall not fear to negotiate. That was not his natural <laughs> way of speaking, either extemporaneously or if he were to prepare remarks for himself. He, he, I think what's something that was very revealing was he used to describe most of his public utterances not as speeches, but as talks. 
you know, he'd say, that was a good talk I gave yesterday. And his, natu his natural way of speaking was more informal, more down to earth, but including a really comprehensive knowledge of public policy, which he could explain in terms that people can understand. I think President Obama generously said, very generously said, that he was the secretary, that President Clinton should be the secretary of explaining stuff. Yeah. And he also had elements of the preacher in him. He knew his Bible. He knew his, the basic texts of American political rhetoric, Lincoln, Jefferson, Martin Luther King. He knew his Shakespeare. So he could have, he could intersperse in what seemed to be very folksy talks. He could intersperse a comprehensive knowledge and a capacity to explain public policy. And he could also be very elevated at, at surprising times. All of a sudden, he would be quoting the Bible, or better yet, as president, the second president Bush would do, citing the Bible without quoting it, without saying what verse it was, just saying something that was biblical. And the people out there who knew their Bible knew, knew what his reference was, but he wasn't ostentatiously saying, this is James chapter 2, verse 1. He was just quoting concepts and phrasings that came from the Bible. But his way of talking was not the way a people expected a president to talk after hearing the first Bush and hearing Ronald Reagan and hearing the public Lyndon Johnson and hearing John F. Kennedy. And in part, that's because he was a, gener he was a generational transition. He was the first baby boomer to be president. He was the first post-Cold War president. He was, as with Jimmy Carter, a president who had previously been a governor of a small southern state and hadn't been on the national stage and didn't speak like people speak who have been in Washington all their adult lives. So he did find his own voice. It was a different voice from what people immediately recognized as a presidential voice. And I think eventually the American people came to identify it as the voice of their president and the voice that they, that they responded to, but it took some time. John? Uh, one thing that uh, speechwriters have to deal with and get used to uh, uh, their own boss's preference on is uh, the use of quotations. Uh, uh, some presidents like to use quotations, others don't, and there's no right way or wrong way. You just have to do it the way the boss wants it. President Bush, George, <laughs> George W., really didn't really didn't want to use a lot of quotations and didn't. Uh, and now and then when we would include one, he would, he would say, oh, how about if I just make this point in my own words um, and send us back to, uh, back to the computer. Um, he wasn't completely opposed to it, but he just had a, a general preference against it. And I heard a great story from Harry <laughs> McPherson, who was a speechwriter for President Johnson, who most of us probably mm -hmm. met. Harry died a few years ago. But he said that um, uh, Johnson, believe that a president should sound really elevated and so he was a very good storyteller but he wasn't a <coughs> particularly good one in presidential speeches because he didn't want to do that he wanted to sound like a very uh, you know uh, he wanted to have a very oratorical um, uh, form to his speeches so his speechwriters uh, put into one of the uh, drafts uh, a quote from Thucydides well Johnson was reading it and he just he couldn't go get through that name he said people gonna know who this is are people going to know what this is all about? I, I, you know, I just can't. What's the name again? And I'm trying to, he's trying to read it. He said, will you tell me again how to say this? He said, forget it. I'm not going to say it. Well, Mr. President, it's a good quote. You liked it. Well, I'm going to use it. I'm just going to say as my dear old daddy used to say. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's some Greek with a father named Thucydides who's scratching his head on that one. So now questions to you in the audience, please. Uh, uh, our terrific panel here is waiting for yours. Hi, thanks so much. I wonder if you could talk about your favorite speech and maybe the story behind why it's your favorite. Either that you've written or, or otherwise. I'll, I'll go. Um, Please. I wrote the President Obama's commencement speech at Morehouse College, uh, which is a historically <laughs> black college in Atlanta. And um, I'm obviously not of that demographic. Uh, but it was fun because I got to write something for him that only he could say. And it was, it was interesting sitting with him. And he 
kind of downloaded what he wanted to say to me. And at the very end, he said, you know, I've, I've, you're going to feel uncomfortable writing some of the stuff that I want to say, but just know that I'm going to be the one saying it and not you. Um, which is, it's a challenge for a speechwriter to write something that's very different, but I think the best speeches of anybody, uh, and especially politicians, are ones that only they can deliver. And I knew that what he was going to say there was something that only he could deliver, and, and he did. Um, so that was, that was just a real, it was a, the most challenging speech I've ever done, and also the most fun. And, and just describe the scene then when he delivers it. You go with him to, yeah, to speech. To you get on a slightly bigger version of this thing, right. fly down. Right. Yeah, and actually he um, got me the last round of edits as this plane was landing. And uh, Air Force One today, even today, still does not have very good internet. It has terribly old computers. And so uh, you've never felt stress like you felt stress trying to em enter edits and send them to the teleprompter as a plane's landing. Um, and you know it's going to be a 10-minute ride, no traffic to the, uh, to the venue. And so that was a little stressful. But um, when he got there, I mean, you see people crying. You see people who are incredibly moved. I, I, we talked about stories of different people in quotes. I found some students who were in the audience, and we told their stories there. And um, you know, we heard from them later uh, just some amazing feed I mean, one of them was just standing up and crying in front of the whole crowd. And so that wasn't because of me. That was because of President Obama. Um, but uh, to help him kind of crystallize that together, I, I think I'm, I'll never forget it. I had. Uh, I, I have a, a favorite speech and a most important speech, if you'll indulge me. My favorite speech was uh, after the first debate with um, with uh, Mondale in, in 84, where, uh, uh, as David knows, remembers, we didn't do too well. And um, uh, President Reagan was uh, sort of down after that. And, and uh, part of the reason was on the flight back to Washington, um, the subject came up as why, uh, from uh, Mrs. Reagan, why we weren't mentioning Mondale in the speeches. And anyway, I won't get into the whole story. So it turns out that uh, uh, he wanted to start hitting Mondale by name and personally. So we had a uh, whistle stop campaign uh, scheduled through Ohio uh, uh, after that. And I, I was designated to write the speech. And basically, I was unleashed to help the president be unleashed. And that was my favorite speech because it was very hard hitting. And we spent the day in. Uh, Southern Ohio on, on President Truman, uh, uh, that uh, same uh, uh, train that he used during his whistle stop campaigns. The most important speech was one I worked on after something called the Bitburg Crisis in 1985 because it was uh, President Reagan's first personal crisis. And I was called in to help bail him, bail him out, I guess is, is a way to put it, but to uh, uh, sit down with him. And he was very distraught about being criticized uh, f uh, f for a situation where uh, they thought he was going to go to Germany and, and lay wreaths on Nazi uh, uh, stormtrooper gr uh, graves. And there was a big furor over that. And, uh, uh, and I came in to help uh, draft a speech where he gave at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in, uh, in Germany. And so that was to me, the most important speech I wrote. All right. On a lighter note, because that is, uh, I'm sure, a very serious moment in his life. But uh, we had to do these, because I was young, I got assigned to a lot of turkey pardonings and Girl <laughs> Scout of the Year awards and things like that. And um, so it was the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And uh, <coughs> generally, what we would do is bring in a lot of funny people <coughs> at night after hours and put a bottle of scotch in the middle of the table and start coming up with jokes, right? So the joke that we came up with was uh, that week of the White House Correspondents' Dinner, uh, a, an impersonator had called the White House saying he was Ali Akbar Rafsanjani, the Speaker of the Iranian Parliament, who is still alive and still around. And he got through the White House switchboard and got all the way to Brent Scowcroft before um, Brent figured out that he was fake. Right? And it made all the press that this impersonator had gotten through the White House switchboard. So the joke that we wrote was, uh, oh, Dennis Miller, you're the host here tonight. Uh, I know your friend, uh, Dana Carvey. And earlier this week, you may have seen that somebody said they were Ali Apgar, Rafsanjani, and they got through the White House switchboard to try to talk to me. Um, and I asked Dana Carvey to call him back. Um, but Dana Carvey said, 
not going to do it, wouldn't be prudent, not at this juncture. <laughs> it's the way it was written, right? So David Demarest, the director of communications, goes in, and he's going through all the jokes with the president. And the president gets to this joke, and he says, I don't, I don't uh, get that joke. And uh, David says, well, he goes, who is this guy, Dana Carvey? And he, says, he says, I'm not like you kids. I don't stay up till 11.30 at night, you know? Because it's before DVRs, you know, if you didn't stay up till 11.30, you didn't see Saturday Night Live. So, um, so David says, well, this guy's on Saturday Night Live, and he does this impersonation of you. And um, it, we think it would be funny if you impersonated him impersonating you. And so the president says, why don't you show me how that would go, Dave? <laughs> and David says, uh, right now? And he says, yeah, yeah, show me how Dana Carvey does me. So David says he sees his whole career flash in front of his eyes. And he says, OK, here's how he does it. You know, not going to be prudent, not at this juncture, you know, not going to happen. And um, the president says, David, do you, uh, do you think people will think that's funny? <laughs> <laughs> David says, totally deadpan. David says, uh, yes, I do. And he says, do you personally find this funny, David? <laughs> David says, yes, I do. And the president says, then I'll do it. And so the president went to the White House Correspondents' Dinner, told a joke that he really didn't get, um, and brought the house down because he was able to do such an exaggerated <laughs> impersonation of himself. Because it is, you know, it's, it's Bush doing Carvey doing Bush, so it's a triple <laughs> exaggeration. And, um, and I think that was the beginning of their friendship, and they've been lifelong friends ever since. That's so really that is one of my favorite moments. Good story. Uh, I'm, I'm, getting, <laughs> I'm getting pulsed here that we've just got a couple minutes until folks have to load on buses and head back south toward LA. So just to David and John, uh, a particular speech that stands out, one minute each maybe? Well, the, the greatest, I mean, the greatest honor you can have as a, a speechwriter for, for a president is to work on the inaugural speech. And I, I, because I had been in the campaign and was going to work in the White House, I got to work on the first inaugural. And there's a very, I think, both sad and moving story connected with that. That from the first, President-elect Clinton intended the theme of it to be generational change in American renewal. And part of it was paying tribute to his predecessor, President Bush and the greatest generation who had defeated Nazism and fascism and contained and outlasted communism. And as we were working on it, the, there was a man named Father Timothy Healy who had been president of Georgetown after President Clinton went there and who was president of the New York Public Library and had been, was a good friend of President Clinton and had advised us on a lot of speeches, particularly a speech he gave it in, during the campaign at Notre Dame University. And Father Healy was going on a well-deserved vacation. And he was in one of the airports in New York, and he collapsed and died of a heart attack. And when they went through his personal effects, they found a tape recorder, tape recording cassette in his jacket pocket. And he had dictated a memo to President-elect Clinton about his thoughts for the inaugural. And they had the passage, and I, I think I know it almost by heart. We hold this ceremony in the dead of winter, but from, by the words we speak and the faces we show the world, we are forcing the spring, Pentecostal fire in the midst of Yuletide, cold. I mean, it's, he said it better than that. And we took that, we used that, that, that last te testament from a man of God, we used that as the central metaphor for President Clinton's first inaugural, Forcing the Spring. It's really great. I, yeah. I would say that there, it was a great privilege to be involved in the speeches around 9-11 uh, and, and the aftermath uh, of the attacks, uh, uh, to be involved in that with President Bush because it was a, um, a man meeting his moment and the speeches uh, uh, are remembered but not for some oratory uh, because the moment only required uh, plain English. Um, and uh, I would say also that the things I, I was most happy to be involved with were eulogies uh, by the president and vice president for President Ronald Reagan. I would, I would not have wanted to miss, miss that when the opportunity came up and consider that a great privilege as well. Really great. Well, thank you all. Um, it's been a really terrific day. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists here, all the panelists from the previous sessions, 
And, and finally, the staff, particularly the staff of the Miller Center that works so hard uh, from uh, 3,000 miles away to pull this together. Um, <laughs> Jeff Chittister, Tony Lucadamo, Karen McGrath, Susan Cortese, and Reed Forbes. Is that all we brought? I think, because uh, it, it probably took at least another five. Oh, and Tom Vandervert is maybe still here, or maybe not. Um, so thank you all. I think uh, some of these folks may still be around afterwards if you're still around, if you have other questions. But I know a number of you are going to be uh, in a bus for about an hour heading back south. So I want to let you get on the road and get back to your families. Thank you. <laughs>